Over the last few years, we've seen several options pop up for building a Raspberry Pi based gaming handheld inside of an original Game Boy shell. Everything from totally off the shelf parts cobbled together like in my original Game Boy Zero video from a few years back, to a nearly turnkey solution like the Circuit Sword from Kite, where you basically just have to drop the board into a shell. For whatever reason though, the Game Boy Pocket hasn't gotten nearly as much attention in that time. Which is a shame, because honestly I kind of prefer it over the original Game Boy. There have been a couple of options, and I even showed you one a while back called the Pocket Pi FE. It had some shortcomings, and there was a lot of drama around its launch. I won't go into details, uh, but suffice it to say, it was kind of a mess. So that's why I'm really excited that Kite is back with another all-in-one board for the Game Boy Pocket Shell called the Circuit Shield. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do in this video. I'll show you around the Circuit Shield, I'll show you all the features and what kind of games you can expect to play on it. Then I'll give you a quick update on what I've been up to lately and a few things that I've got coming up. And then the second half of the video is gonna be the build process of putting a Circuit Shield together. I'll show you how to modify the shell and how to put it together. And I'll go over some custom parts that I've made uh, to make that process easier as well. So this is the Circuit Shield. It's another one of Kite's all-in-one boards that he's made for a few different retro console shells at this point. If you're familiar with his Circuit Sword for the original Game Boy shell, it's pretty much that just shrunk down to fit inside of a Game Boy Pocket shell. There's a little bit of soldering involved, but otherwise you just need to modify a shell and drop it in there. I styled mine after my turquoise Nintendo Switch Lite, uh, more on that in just a minute. It's got all the features of its big brother, like USB Type-C charging, external access to the micro SD card, HDMI output, which I think is actually still a work in progress at this point, USB type A port for transferring ROMs, Wi-Fi on board, and a Raspberry Pi compute module three at the heart of it. The board also has a spot for an optional analog stick that you can add if you want to. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. I highly recommend doing that. And button pads for a total of six face buttons. Although personally, I'm fine with just adding X and Y buttons. It's also got Kite's stellar on-screen menu that lets you adjust various settings like volume, brightness, and even access an on-screen keyboard. You bring it up with this handy rocker switch on the side, which can also be used to quickly adjust the volume. It's also got a headphone jack, as you would expect, as well as safe shutdown, so you can just flick the power switch to trigger a shutdown sequence to shut it down safely without corrupting the SD card. So one of the most common questions that I get on these kinds of videos is what kinds of games can I play on it? Well, it's a Compute Module 3 in there, which is basically Raspberry Pi 3. So if you go here on YouTube and search Raspberry Pi 3 Retro Pi Performance, you'll get a much better idea. But as you can see here, everything from Game Boy to Super NES, Sega Genesis, all of that runs flawlessly. And so does Game Boy Advance and PlayStation 1, which is particularly nice to have that analog stick for. And some N64 games even run really well. Now you're gonna find a lot of them that don't run very well at all or have dips here and there, but several of the more popular ones like Super Mario 64 and Mario Kart 64 run pretty darn well. I ran my favorite battery rundown test of Super Metroid with Wi-Fi on, and it lasted right at seven hours. I ran the same test with Wi-Fi off, but that didn't really seem to make much of a difference at all. Then I tested N64, and it lasted about six and a half hours. So if you use the recommended battery, which I'll link to in the blog post, that's about what you can expect, which is pretty great for such a small device. Okay, so that's the Circuit Shield. The way that Kite does ordering for his boards, uh, he'll put up pre-orders every couple of months and he'll leave those open for a few weeks so anybody who wants one can go and pre-order one. Then after pre-orders close is when he'll do a manufacturing run and then once those get finished, he'll start shipping those out to people. As of the posting of this video, pre-orders are currently closed, but don't worry, he will do more in the future. Uh, just keep an eye on his website, give him a follow on Instagram, sign up for his mailing list uh, to make sure that you don't miss the next round of pre-orders. Okay, so what have I been up to? Uh, well, you might have noticed things have been kind of weird and crazy and just downright scary all around the world uh, for the last few weeks. And usually the way that I personally react to situations like that is to kind of go into a super introverted mode where I don't really want to do much of anything. That's why you haven't seen me posting much on Instagram or other social media. 
So honestly, I don't have a whole lot to show for the month of March. That's why it didn't get its own update video. But uh, by all accounts, this is gonna be our new normal for at least a while. So I'm trying to snap out of that, trying to get back into the groove of things, doing projects. I did do a few things though. I finished updating the parts for the Minty Pie Lite. So those are all ready to go and I can start on that video right after this one. An update or two ago, I showed you a Pokeball deck holder that I had made. Uh, I finally got that up on Thingiverse for everybody to download, and I've got another version of it as well to fit decks that have sleeves on them too. I also made this box to store all of our spare cards. Uh, we're all at home all the time together now, and my kids have been playing that game a lot. It's kind of random, but that's why we've gotten into that. I've also started printing out face shields for local clinics and hospitals to help medical professionals stay safe. I know we all feel kind of helpless right now, so it feels good to be able to help even if it's just a little bit. I do have a few smaller projects uh, coming up that I want to get done and I want to get some videos out there, give you guys something to watch, maybe some projects that you can look forward to and things like that. Okay, so that's what I've been up to. Keep an eye out for some smaller project videos here in the coming weeks. Um, and now I'll show you how to put together a circuit shield. Okay, so these are the custom parts that I came up with to make my build easier. And all of the models to print out your own are available up on Patreon for supporters, and I'll have them available for everybody else here after a while. If you don't have a 3D printer or laser cutter and you want to use these parts, uh, I'll also have them available on the Pseudomod shop. And if modifying the shell isn't your thing, if you're afraid that you'll mess it up or whatever, then there's someone you should definitely be following. Uh, he goes by a little troublemaker on the forums and on the Discord server, and he's been dialing in his CNC to automate the process of cutting out the shell on original Game Boys for things like the Circuit Sword. After he's got that done, then he's going to be doing the same thing for Game Boy Pocket Shells for the Circuit Shield. So if you're interested in that, then keep an eye on his Instagram account. Uh, I'm sure he'll have some updates there. This is a drill guide to drill pilot holes for the buttons that we're going to add on the front of the case. The kit from Kite does come with a drill guide, um, and it works just fine if you're really careful and drill perfectly straight. But as you can see here, the fact that it's offset from the shell, if you're not careful and drilling perfectly straight, you can end up with holes that are pretty far off from where you want them to be. So on the one that I made, the holes go all the way to the shell, so there's virtually no wiggle room when you put the drill bit in there. This makes it a lot easier to drill the holes exactly where you want them to go. The board also has a hole in it so that you can mark where your joystick is gonna go, but it has the same issue, so I went ahead and made another drill guide for that that just snaps down into here, and same thing, there's hardly any wiggle room on the drill bit, so it makes it a lot easier to drill the hole exactly where you want it to be. Then I've got this screen bracket or shim or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it slides onto the screw posts in the front of the case and makes it so that you can drop your screen right in there to line it up perfectly for you. It's laser cut out of acrylic, so it's super accurate. There's virtually no wiggle room in there at all. Uh, so yeah, you just drop it in there and you're done. Then I've got these button wells. These are 3D printed in a resin printer and they just kind of drop into here. And when you add your buttons, it will hold them in place, keep them from rotating. Uh, and then it also has a raised ridge around the edge. And that's for the silicone button membrane to go on top of, uh, and it'll hold that in place as well. You can print this on a traditional FDM printer if you want, uh, but those layer lines are gonna make it so that the button might give kind of a scratchy feeling as you push them in and out. So the nice smooth finish of the resin printed ones are much nicer here. Then I've got these also printed resin button caps for the L and R buttons. Those are going to be used in conjunction with an FDM printed button holder that will screw in here to the back of the case. And then I've got some drill guides that will screw into place so that you can drill your holes exactly where they need to go. And then just for fun, I made a PSP joystick cap in the same style as the Nintendo Switch Lite joysticks to finish off the Nintendo Switch look that I was going for. And just to note, throughout this video, you might see me using a Compute Module 3 Plus in here, but in the kits that he's shipping out, it's just a regular Compute Module 3. So for the front of the shell, first we're gonna remove some stuff from the inside. You're definitely gonna wanna get a pair of flush cutters for this, it just makes it so much easier. Uh, first, I'm gonna snip off all of this wall around the screen here. Just make sure that you keep all of the screw holes. After you do that with the flush cutters, you'll probably wanna go around it with a chisel-shaped razor just to clean it up and get it nice and smooth. Now you can get these nice glass screen lenses from Bluish Squirrel, I'll put a link in the blog post, but when you put it on the shell, you can see that some of that shell needs to get cut out. So we're going to shave off a few millimeters from each side. Uh, you don't have to worry about getting it perfectly clean or anything because that screen lens is gonna be covering it up. And yeah, just a few millimeters from each side should do it. 
Uh, next, snip off these bits here at the bottom, and we're also gonna remove a chunk of this wall that goes around the speaker. Okay, so next we need to drill our pilot holes for the X and Y buttons, as well as one for the joystick. For this part, I recommend putting some masking tape on the front of it so that you don't scratch it up. So this drill guide has two walls on it that you can press against these two edges in the shell uh, to make sure that it's lined up right. So put it in there, press it against those edges, and screw it down. The joystick drill guide, though, you can just push into place. Uh, just make sure that these arrows are both pointing up towards the top of the shell. Now for actually drilling the holes, if you have access to a drill press, it will make it so much easier. You can still do it by hand if you're really careful, uh, but the drill press allows you to clamp it down and drill perfectly straight. After you drill the pilot holes, you're going to want to make the holes wider using a stepper bit like this. They need to be a little over 9mm wide. And then the joystick hole needs to be a little over 12mm wide. Last thing that we need to do on the front of the shell is shave off this tab right here so that we can access the USB Type-C port. So the PSP joystick is totally optional, you have to get it separately, but it's cheap and really easy to install. Uh, there's just a few pads here on the back that you need to add some solder to to connect it to these points on the board. There's a hole in the board that lines up with a screw hole on the joystick, so you can stick something like a screw through there uh, to help you line it up. So first add a little bit of solder to just one of the pads, line it up, drag your soldering iron tip across the pad to attach it to that point on the board, flip it over and check your alignment. That's why we only did one of those points, so if you need to adjust it, it's still easy to do that. After you've got it all lined up, add some solder to the other pads, and that's it. You'll also want to snip off the screw holes uh, from the joystick. Again, totally optional, but I recommend it because you can play PlayStation games and N64 games using it since we've got that Compute Module 3 in there that's actually powerful enough to play a lot of those games. And like I mentioned, the button wells just kind of slide into place there, and you can drop your buttons in. Now for the silicone membrane that goes on the X and Y buttons, you're going to need to chop that almost in half, kind of like this. That's so it'll be able to fit next to the A and B buttons. The screen bracket should slide over those screw posts that we kept when we were cutting out the shell. Now for the speaker, that will come with the connector but it won't be actually connected to the speaker. You'll need to chop off all but about an inch of the wire and you'll need to connect it to the speaker but the polarity does not matter. So in other words, it doesn't matter which side the red and black goes on. Now you'll notice that I only put a screw here, here, and here. That's because all the other screw holes are going to be attached to the back side of the shell. Now for the back of the shell, first we're going to remove the bulk of this battery compartment here. Just make sure that you keep both of these screw holes here. You can remove this metal shielding, we're not going to need it. And if you have a Dremel, that'll make this part a lot faster. And then you can clean up the rest with some flush cutters. You want to make sure that you keep this post here as well because that'll help support the PCB that's resting on it. So the battery compartment should look about like this when you're done. Go ahead and snip off both of these bits here at the bottom. And then we're going to remove both of these walls on the side here to make room for the L and R buttons that we're going to add here in a minute. But you want to make sure that you keep the bottom two screw holes because that's what we're going to use to keep the 3D printed part in place. This is another spot where you're going to want to go back and clean up with a chisel shaped razor to get it smooth against the bottom. So the drill guides for the L and R buttons, they slide into these screw holes here and screw in from the other side. And then you can drill your holes, they need to be about 4 millimeters wide. As usual, a drill press will make this a little bit easier on you. So now we're going to remove some of the back here that's to make room for the Raspberry Pi. It's just barely too thick to fit on there without removing that. Next, we're going to widen this hole here where the contrast wheel goes so that it's wide enough for the SD card. So just shave off a millimeter or two from each side, and that should be enough. Then we're also going to cut a hole for the HDMI port. So you can put the board in there and mark exactly where you need to cut. You'll also need to remove a little bit from this screw post here, and then you can just go at it with a razor, or you can use a Dremel to remove the bulk of the material and then clean up with the razor. Now we'll get the actual L and R buttons ready. There's this wiring harness that plugs in just above the speaker, and each of the wires are labeled. So we've got ground L1 and L2, ground R1 and R2. So one of those ground wires is going to go to the right side, 
and one of those is going to go to the left side. These are the tactile switches that I'm using. They are six millimeters square and two and a half millimeters thick. And the way that these work, there's basically two pieces of metal running through here, one on the top and one on the bottom for these two pins. So the top two pins and the bottom two pins are connected. And then when you click the button in, it connects the two sides to complete the circuit. So we're gonna attach ground to one of those and then the actual button wire to the other one. And then we'll continue that ground connection from the first button to the next one. Hopefully that makes sense. This is what it'll look like when it's done. Uh, and I'll also have a wiring diagram on the blog post. The other side of this piece opposite of the buttons has some built-in supports that you'll need to take some pliers and twist out of there. You'll also want to go back with the file and smooth it out because uh, this is going to be holding the battery. So you want to make sure there aren't any sharp pieces. So after you're done with that, put your buttons in there and put those printed button holders into place. You can screw those down, but don't screw them down all the way just yet. Leave them loose. We'll be putting our battery in there in just a minute. This is the recommended battery for the project. This number here represents the dimensions. So this is 5.0 millimeters thick, 50 millimeters wide, and 80 millimeters long. It does not come with a battery connector on it, but you can get a JST extension cord and add it pretty easily. You just need to make sure that the polarity is correct on it meaning that when you're holding it with the tab facing up, the red wire is on the left and the black wire is on the right. So now I'm gonna get a cartridge ready to cover up the battery. You can get aftermarket ones, but I really wanted to use a white one. So I'm gonna take the actual cartridge part out of this Tamagotchi one that a good friend of mine sent me a while back. I can reshell that into another one so the game is still playable. And we're gonna cut this so that it's about 30 millimeters long. And we're also gonna cut off this wall here on the front part just behind these tabs. You can glue the back and front sides together and then I'm gonna add a custom sticker here. And then next, put it inside the shell and mark where we had that cutout for the Raspberry Pi because we're gonna need to do the same thing on the cartridge. It should just fit over the battery so then you can stick it in there and then finish screwing those two sides down. So those two button holders are actually gonna be holding the battery in place as well. And then hopefully if you got everything on the shell cut out properly, uh, everything should fit in there pretty nicely. Last but not least, we're gonna attach the screen lens. But first, uh, if you look down in here, you can see that there are some LEDs on the circuit shield to show you if it's turned on or charging, that kind of thing. So I'm gonna add a laser cut acrylic piece that I've sanded on both sides to kind of diffuse that LED and just make it look a little bit nicer. Okay, so you're gonna need a few things for this part. You're gonna need some kind of double-sided tape this is the stuff that Kite recommends. It's what he sent me. Uh, and you can just search Amazon for 467 MP and it should come up. Just about any double-sided tape should work though. And then you're gonna need some kind of cleaning wipe to clean off the screen and the lens before you put it together. And then you're definitely gonna want some canned air to blow all the dust out of there. Now, if you want to make absolutely sure that no dust can get in there down the road, uh, you're going to want to make sure that there are no gaps in here like I have. I'm not too concerned about it, so I'm just going to leave mine as is. And that's it. All right, guys. Well, if you made it this far, then thanks for watching through the whole thing. As usual, a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. I really appreciate it. Uh, that money winds up going towards paying for hosting fees for the website, uh, parts for new projects, and things like that. Anyway, thanks again for watching, guys, and I will see you next time.